So I just say just hold people accountable, ask them to set standards and enforce them, and, and hopefully you can just move forward. Charles? <laughs> um, well, I have a bit of a negative, perhaps cynical view on the government. <laughs> I, they, they seem to be able to do three things. One is they can throw money at something. They never take it away. They can throw money at something. They can add people and in, in organizations. I've never seen them take it away. Or they can blow stuff up. I mean, so if, if you can use one of those three tools, you, you, can, you can do something, which is why I think the Fatah reason is, is, is a good example, because you know, we can spend money in people, and then we can blow stuff up there. And it, and it seems to have a, you know, I, I don't know, it has some positive effect. Um, <laughs> if I might just mm -hmm. slightly off, I, I would like to pick up on a point that Steve made, and the, um, it, it strikes me again. This is from Baghdad experience that, that inoculating the population's reaction it, psychologically to an event it might pay some some dividends. Um, in Baghdad, you know, the car bombs go off all the time, and eh, people, you know, it doesn't really affect the normal commerce of Baghdad, you know, whatever that is. But um, <laughs> I, I think that, that it's, you know, I don't mean to be glib here, but, but to the extent that, that the population um, is, is pre-informed that, you know, a, a, a chemical weapons attack, that you know, it's not as bad as I'm sure the media would, would pump it up in the event that it had happened. So that I think, you know, we might be able to, through some kind of a, you know, education program, you know, dampen reaction um, that might occur when, if the report is correct, you know, the odds are some event happens in the next few years. Um, the biological community reacted with uh, deep ambivalence to this report. It was my impression, just from talking to people. And in part because uh, they didn't like the implications of the fact that the 15,000 people who are now trained to work in BSL-3 and 4, the high security laboratories, were being portrayed, some of them felt, in this report as potential terrorists. <laughs> and the recommendations on securing these places and making these people aware of the uh, dangerous quality of the pathogens with which they were working did not go over well. It, 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 uh, some people argued that it was going to discourage qualified and good people from going into science if, they were, if what they were doing was suddenly being viewed as a potential threat to national security rather than a potential solution to uh, our health problems. Do you think that's a, a fair concern? Uh, was the report too uh, hard on the uh, on this problem of the proliferation of high security labs and the people who work in them? Well, I'd like to comment on that because I think that the, what I saw in the report was, from the perspective of a worker, was that maybe we don't understand that the agent we're working on has the potential to be extremely harmful. And I think rather than being concerned that you might think I'm a terrorist because I work on anthrax or plague or another agent, I think the more important underlying uh, feeling that I got from the report was that you think I don't know that. Because I think that we're much smarter than that. And I believe that most people um, that work with these, it goes back a little bit to the issue of do you understand and, and how do you feel about that? Are you uh, a well-informed citizen? Are you afraid of it? Well, if you work with it every day, if you understand the, the nature of the, the agent you're working with, you understand the threat. So I don't think it's that we don't understand the threat. I think that the, the piece that I found good in the report was that we need to improve security. But that's a, a matter of, let's get some leadership out there. And if you've got to lock the door, lock the dang door. <laughs> I mean, how hard is this? But in any event, I, I really believe that it's more underlying issues. It's clearly a tension in that ultimately this expertise lies in this community and it's not very effective for government to alienate the community that you ultimately need to have as an ally. So while some prudent measures should be taken and nobody should be taking an offense, they've got to block doors and so forth here, I think one of the things that with a little bit of tweaking you're really trying to figure out how within this community you can kind of 
bake in this awareness that people with malicious intent may be exploiting what is for good science and, and ultimately, in many cases, as research is leading for the kinds of things that will make us healthier at the end of the day. That there's peer kind of reinforcement, that there's some effort to develop the kinds of codes of conduct we try to do in the medical field particularly, but we apply it with a security kind of uh, lens as well. And where, you know, opportunities, promotions and so forth there are in part of your you know, demonstrating and abiding by this with code of ethics, or a sense that if somebody's not abiding by it, that there's some shame within the community for not doing so. But I, I think in the end of the day, it's not sort of people outside trying to impose entirely outside of some very prudent things. We really do well if we somehow partner this in a way that the community recognizes and starts to build in its own social controls to both identify and ideally incentivize the kinds of behaviors that we want. And that really doesn't exist in this community as much as it needs to. Yeah. At one point, Matt Messelson was uh, lobbying for, and I think still is, a what he called a Hippocratic Oath for right. biologists, mm -hmm. the do no harm rule. Uh, do these kind of moral mechanisms, uh, or do they go, do they, would they help us uh, create a kind of uh, culture that would discourage uh, the misuse of uh, dangerous uh, biological materials, or chemists for that matter? I th th by no means are they going to be fail-safe, uh, but they get you in the right direction. You know, where right now the rewards may primarily about discovering the great cure for cancer kind of thing, um, and you do whatever it takes to sort of come up with that eureka moment, you you you're trying to obviously inculcate uh, some sense of these other sort of safeguards given what they're dealing with. So, uh, And another anecdote, when, when we look at the community at large, one of the challenges we had in the military was that oftentimes the medical community is very trusting and giving away information that they don't realize the other side may be uh, pulling that information out in order to understand uh, a way to, to cause some harm. So I think in addition to just having an ethic that we understand that what we're doing must be good, but also to understand that there may be somebody out there trying to exploit our knowledge. I, Judy, I, I think there's a disconnect here. I think there's, the, this report paints a very draconian, scary picture of what uh, weapons of mass destruction could do if they fall in the hands of terrorists. But then when it comes down to implementation, actually tighten things up, we, we lose our nerve. And then and things go too slowly. There have been improvements on the level three and level four lab security in the U.S. over the last seven or eight years. But it's taken seven or eight years. It's, it's, it's extraordinary how slow it is. There has been improvement of the management of, of chemical facilities. DHS is starting now, again, seven, eight years later, to have a regime for the, for the protection of, of, of chemical uh, sites. Uh, radiological materials, I still think, are not well managed and handled. Uh, and I think that a lot more needs to be done in looking at the people. So we need to be consistent. If we're going to write a report that raises the specter of the horror of these type of weapons. We have to have recommendations say, no, we're not going to we're not going to sit still and allow people to say, well, we we feel threatened that you have to, you have a culture of security in defense contracting in the U.S. government. People don't feel like that you have to get a security clearance that your 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 uh, integrity is being questioned. It's part of the business. So I think that if we're really serious about this threat, then we have to take the steps commensurate with it, and that's make some tough political decisions and tell some of these industries they're going to have to step up. And I think we're, we just haven't, we haven't, been, we haven't had the political courage to do that. <clears throat> well, I, I'm not sure we even now have the, uh, the chemical uh, regulations that were proposed under the Bush administration and proposed and reproposed and watered down. And right. where, what is the status of that? Does anybody know? Well, it's, it's a mess still. It's uh, <laughs> DHS was finally given the authority for the first time in, in not in direct language, but as a part of an appropriations bill with a two-year clock to begin the process of setting security standards at chemical plants. But whoops, Congress forgot to give them money to do it, <laughs> and the total amount of experts within DHS, let's say, are relatively small. And this is a community, this is a very complex problem, you know, sprawled across the country. The approach also is you can't, in enforcing these regulations, you can't actually, uh, any single breach is not enough to force an action. You have to have a series of breaches. You know, there's layers, of course, involved. Well, this is a lawyer's, you know, happy day. Uh, I, I, you know, this, there's so much that you could wrap the bureaucracy 